Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of 3M, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the State of Science Index Survey. The COVID-19 pandemic has reshaped life as we know it. Rarely in recent memory has the world faced such an immediate and widespread global threat as complex as the coronavirus. Almost overnight, our everyday lives were turned upside down. Throughout it all, we have adapted and we have risen to the challenge. Many of us stayed home, avoided contacting people and adapted habits as frequent hand washing, physical distancing and masking to stay safe. Of all the arenas in life that COVID has impacted, science is perhaps the field that has been transformed the most. The pandemic has created an entirely new research environment one that is now structured for collaboration and communication above all else. Our scientists have acted with unprecedented speed and coordinated action to deliver us with a range of medical solutions to confront this global threat. From accelerating the development of um, production of COVID-19 tests, treatments, and vaccines developed at record speed, and most importantly, ensuring that all people and all countries can get access to these vaccines. Science has more than ever proved to be increasingly relevant in our lives. As we look back on a year of profound change since the COVID-19 pandemic became a reality across the world, it is clear to see how far we have come. This optimism is reflected in the findings of our State of Science Index um, 2021 that I'm delighted to share with you today. Devised by 3M, the independent research study explores the global attitudes towards science, taking the polls on how people think and feel about the field and its impact on the world. This year's survey draws upon in-depth interactions with respondents from 17 countries countries worldwide from February to March 2021, making it the largest data pool to date. As attention turns to vaccines, people in the UAE are, uh, are counting on science to help restore and rejuvenate their lives, enable their, their road to recovery, whether being hopeful that science will save us from the pandemic, 87% agree or believing science will be the reason 2021 is a better year than 2020. More people appreciate what science can do. The public image of science globally has improved with trust in, in science uh, remaining at the highest level recorded in the four years since the state of science index began tracking it. In UAE, skepticism in science continue to be high, 52%, positioning the UAE among the most skeptical countries surveyed. Two thirds, 67% say that science unifies those with opposing views, while one third, 33% believe it divides. Among those who are skeptical of science, 60% cite the reason to the various conflicting opinions shared by scientists, as well as 50% believe that science is influenced by corporate agendas, while 53% state that it is just the nature to question things. Young talent is a key factor in building a bright future. A newfound enthusiasm for science in you uh, suggest that the image of science may continue to improve as younger generations age. Scientists and medical professionals are inspiring people to pursue STEM-based careers in the future, especially among younger generations. Over three quarters, 79% are more inspired to pursue a STEM career due to the pandemic, rising to 84% among millennials. And while 89% agree 
the world needs more people pursuing STEM careers, barriers to entry remain. To diversify the STEM fields, we must take a hard look at the stereotypes and biases that still prevail today. One way 3M relayed the message of hope and inspiration for future generations to overcome inherited biases and break through boundaries is through a new documentary, Not the Science Type, featuring four female scientists who challenge these stereotypes, confronting discrimination as they rise to prominence in their fields of science. The film produced by 3M in partnership with Generous Films and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, known as AAAS, and debuted at a special screening at the Tribeca Film Festival, aimed to spark a conversation about STEM equity and the need for greater diversity, equity, and inclusion in the four disciplines. Like the pandemic, climate change is a global problem that can only be solved with collective action. COVID-19 taught us some hard but important lessons about trusting experts, focusing on prevention, and learning to cooperate across borders and industries to address existential risks. 3M remains committed to applying its science and technological expertise to help advance waste reduction, improve water quality, and re reduce carbon emission. In February 2021, 3M announced its investment of approximately $1 billion over the next 20 years to accelerate new environmental goals, ach achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, reduce water usage by 25% at its facilities, and return higher quality water to the environment after use in manufacturing operations. The company expects to further reduce carbon emissions, aiming for a 50% reduction by 2030, an 80% reduction by 2040, and 100% carbon neutrality in its operations by 2050. The pandemic has revealed the crucial role that multi stakeholder collaboration between governments companies and other organizations must play in addressing challenges of its scale and the power of technology to enable and accelerate that collaboration. There is a clear relevance for a single hub enabling faster decision-making in our post-pandemic world where vaccinations, testing and contact tracing and working from anywhere are the new norm. We can use these lessons that highlight the value of collaboration, technology, and data as a template for future health crisis and as we adapt to our future world. The UAE, with its progressive and decisive leadership, is leading the charge when it comes to shared responsibility. We all have witnessed how the UAE leadership saw the importance of transparent case reporting. PCR testing, and now vaccinations, and how it has led the world in its approach throughout. In the same way, businesses are expected to follow suit, step in and lead with clarity and transparency to establish trust. Something I see time and time again within the UA leadership and across businesses in the region. As leaders, we must do everything we can to support the recovery of our nation. The outlook is positive, but we all need to play our part in making growth a reality as we continue to adapt to a post COVID-19 world. We know science can improve lives and that we all have something to gain from society in general to individual countries and future generations. But if everyday citizens don't see that, it doesn't matter what we in the science community believe. Understanding how science is perceived is an important first step to having an informed conversation about this important topic. For the time being, it looks like 
the coronavirus is here to stay, but it is possible to live normally with it in our midst, thanks to the latest scientific breakthroughs. Before we kickstart the webinar, I would like to thank all the speakers who are going to share their insights with us today, starting with His Excellency, Dr. Amin Alamiri, Assistant Undersecretary of the Ministry of Health and Prevention in the UAE, will be our key keynote speaker. Kara Nazari, Managing Director of the American Chamber of Commerce Dubai, who will be our panel moderator. Our very own and inspiring Camilla Cruz Durlacher, 3M Vice President for R&D Operations for Europe, Middle East and Africa region. Jed Bitar, Managing Director and Partner Healthcare for the Boston Consulting Group. Ishan Anaptavi, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Marketing Officer for Microsoft UAE. And Patrick Noack, Executive Director, Future Foresight and Imagination for the Dubai Future Foundation. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the keynote speaker, His Excellency, Dr. Am Dr. Amin Alamiri. His Excellency is the Assistant Undersecretary of the Health Regulation Sector at the UAE Ministry of Health and Prevention. He is responsible for the following departments at MOHAP, Drug Department, Control, Audit and Inspection Department, Licensing and Accreditation Department, Standards and Guidelines Department, Organ Donation and Transplantation Office. Thank you so much for being with us here today as a distinguished leader and an influence, influencer voice in, in this field, we greatly appreciate your presence to share your thoughts and opinion on the aforementioned subject. I'll now hand over the stage to you to share your thoughts on the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lazio. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it is my profound honor to be here with you at the State of Science Index. For sure, uh, the uh, STEM in healthcare, which stands for science, technology, engineering, math, is very important. Allow me to share with you. In fact, um, UAE has been looking into this subject since more than 20 years. This has been started in UAE as a vision, how to improve our country and how the country, which is the United Arab Emirates, this beautiful country which you are living in, to be one of the best and to concentrate on the future, four main pillars at we said science, technology, engineering, and math. And this has been started since at the time of uh, late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Hayyan, uh, in which he uh, was saying that the future generation needs to be aware and it needs to be prepared for the a new uh, uh, era. And this is something which we have to look into it and to make sure that we, we will be able to concentrate on the uh, key section in science. And this is the key section in science which has been adopted by the government of United Arab Emirates. I'm quite sure that you are aware of what's going in this beautiful country. And we are trying to move so fast. And UAE is the only Arab country that reached to this space. Space and science technology, this is one of the main pillars which we are concentrating in. Uh, medical research and doing the clinical trials. I'm quite sure you know that we started to do the clinical trials on the, on the vaccine called uh, Sinopharm. And we produced the first biological vaccine in the region was in the UAE called Hayat uh, Sinopharm, Hayat Fax. 3D printing, which we started to do uh, using the 3D uh, printing and using the cells of the human being for different uh, plastic surgeries, nu uh, nuclear technology, and developing science and technology through education, and the new technology which is being adopted for different level of the schools, information and communication technology, which we feel that this will be the future of the uh, countries, and UAE always looking forward towards the new technologies. Having said that, the UAE government decided to reshape the ministries here in the UAE. I'm quite sure you know that we are the only country which we had the Ministry of Artificial Intelligence. 
And also we have a, a Ministry of Advanced Technology. Now, the, uh, before it was Ministry of Industry. Now the name is Ministry of Industry and Advanced Technology. And this is the proof to everyone that through the uh, 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 new allocating of the, uh, the or uh, reshaping the name of the ministries, we are going towards the STEM. And the UAE, uh, uh, I mean, uh, artificial intelligence uh, strategy has been developed until 2020, uh, 2031. And this is, has been also announced. I'm quite sure you know that we are the only country in the world that we have Ministry of Possibilities. And this is a virtual ministry for the UAE government that there is nothing impossible in our country. Everything is possible, but we have to find out the way and the, uh, the procedures uh, for it. And therefore, we have the National Program of Artificial Intel uh, Intelligence. And this national program is concentrating on many different sectors. If I will go and talk about the health sector, health sector is one of the sectors which is booming in United Arab Emirates. I remember uh, uh, 12 years back, uh, I used to present among the, the different international conferences that the government of the UAE is covering almost 65% as a service provider for the healthcare sector, and the rest of the 35% is being done by the private sector. Today, I'm so proud to, to tell you it's the completely the opposite. Almost 55% of the healthcare service is being provided by the private sector and only 45 by the government. And this is a good indication and proof to everyone that we are trying to let the private sector to compete with us and to let the private sector to be one of the strongest pillar at the field of the healthcare system. Uh, uh, healthcare, uh, system. Let me share with you some of the examples of the new technologies and how to depend upon the new science and artificial intelligence. I'm quite sure you attended the Arab Health in 2019, which has Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, uh, Prime, uh, uh, Vice Pre uh, President, Prime Minister, ruler of Dubai, launched the first the uh, uh, smart application called Hayat, smart application that allows you, everyone who lives in this beautiful country, the United Arab Emirates, to be an organ donor. And therefore we also established the, uh, uh, the, the or we had a new law for organ transplant. And until today we have, we benefited from 46 cadavers, which is the brain death. <clears throat> and we started for last two years to do the transplant of the most complicated organs. Um, I'm so proud to say until today, we had 11 heart transplants, which is done in Cleveland, Abu Dhabi. I have 31 uh, uh, liver transplant and six lung. This is the first time at the history of the U U United Arab Emirates. This is done through using the organs from the cadavers or the deceased uh, donors. And we had 103, uh, 132 cadavers. But using the technology, using the artificial in intelligence on the, on the right top, which that each single person can be, we have a, a donor. We have so far three, 1,095 donors, which they submitted through their uh, smart application through their mobile phone to be an organ donor. If you will go further and to see what's happening in our hospitals, either governmental or the private, we were the first, the fourth country in the world and the first country in the, in the, uh, among the Gulf state countries that we introduced the robotic uh, machines called Da Vinci. This machine is being used in our Kasmi Hospital charger for cardiovascular diseases and for urology also. And we are using the, uh, the tele-ICU services on, on the left side, which is again, we are unique. Uh, we manage with the, uh, 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 with, the uh, with Washington at the United States of America. We are trying to implement the top uh, uh, artificial intelligence and top te technologies to make sure that we will be able to help the patients through also the telemedicine, even if the patient they are away or they are at home or uh, uh, to be connected with the top uh, international, the most eminent uh, doctors uh, worldwide. Uh, let me talk about the uh, uh, drug safety, which is one of the top uh, priorities in the United Arab Emirates. At the, at the left on the top, this is a machine called TrueScan at the size of the mobile. We were the first country in the region to introduce this machine. We can define or differentiate between uh, uh, counterfeit medicine or fake medicine and the originated one. In seven seconds, we have all those uh, machines being uh, distributed among 
uh, different airports and seaports, which it means that none of the counterfeit medicine could come to the UAE. And also we are so active in importing and re-exporting and 3M is one of the leading company which we have in, in Dubai, which they are very active in importing and re-exporting through, through their uh, logistic hub. And we have more than 32 logistic hub for international pharma companies. And they are bringing their medication to Dubai and re-exporting to different countries. By using those machines, we are able also to protect the, the health of the other communities at other 41 countries. At the middle, uh, uh, this is a new technology which we are using artificial uh, uh, technology in controlling the, uh, the physicians by prescribing the controlled uh, and uh, narcotics to the patients to uh, uh, stop uh, allowing anyone to be uh, drug addicted. And on the, light, on the, on the right side on the top, we, just as an informant, uh, 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 enforcement to uh, the healthcare sector that we have uh, uh, new technologies that can be used by fathers, mothers. They can define who, who are the best doctors available in the country by just uh, three steps. They can define which is the best hospital, which best or the clean, nearest uh, clinics. And also they can also look in to uh, find out different type of drugs, their prices and their active ingredients just with the three touch by using uh, the smart technology, which is the available on, on uh, at your smartphone at uh, the name of, of Mohab. Uh, during the pandemic situation, you, you were the first country by using the technologies, by uh, introducing the new vaccines. So far, we have eight vaccines registered in the UAE. We have uh, Sinopharm, we have Hyatvax produced in UAE, we have Pfizer, AstraZeneca, we have Sinopharm, we have Moderna, and uh, also uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Johnson and Johnson, and soon you will be having uh, 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 a new vaccine. Will be number nine. We will announce soon, and we have a Sputnik, which is the Russian one. Uh, we were the first country to introduce those vaccines in the region by using the new technologies as a fast track uh, drug registration. But also, let me tell you one thing: we are very active in allowing the patients to take their treatment here and supporting the medical tourism and that uh, uh, we need for them the best uh, uh, medicines, the most innovative uh, medicine, which is being approved recently by FDA and the state or EMA in Europe. I'm quite sure that you heard through the media that we were the second country in the world after US to introduce a medicine called Sotrovimab for the treatment of the COVID-19 and the treatment exceeds 80% immediately. 80% uh, uh, of the cases. We were the second country in the world after the United States of America. By using uh, uh, new technologies and fast track registration, we were able to support the humanity and the people, community of UAE, and also the rest of the countries which they will come and take their treatment here in the United Arab Emirates as a part of medical tourism. During the pandemic situation, smart applications for COVID-19, al husn I'm quite sure that everyone downloaded al husn and also we use the new technology uh, as a strategic partnership with Huawei that we introduced this small vehicle that could uh, take the PPEs to different houses and controlled by a computer system. And this is something that we are so proud of, of, of doing that and supporting the, uh, the, uh, the, the people and not to expose them to the, to the risk and to come to the hospitals. And also we introduced the usage of the stem cells for the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, 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 As an outcome of ha what, what have been said, we became number one globally in terms of uh, uh, vaccination rate, number one globally in PCR testing, number three globally for uh, uh, residence satisfaction, and uh, number one among the Arab countries for, uh, uh, as per the statement from uh, Bloomberg COVID countries uh, uh, realance uh, uh, ranking. And also, we are uh, lowest in in uh, in uh, in in, uh, in fatality rates, and number one Arab countries in producing the COVID uh, vaccine locally, which uh, is Hayat uh, uh, Sinopharm. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are so lucky as Emirati, and we are, and you are so lucky who who you live in this beautiful country that you have the leaders who support the country. I'm quite sure. Today's newspaper are speaking, all the media, about five ministries, which yesterday they announced about their vision 
the vision of supporting the investment, the vision of supporting the technology, the vision of supporting the industry, the vision of supporting artificial intelligence, the vision of supporting the investors to come and invest in the UAE and give them golden visa or green visa or different or, or different type of visas. And this is an outcome of the vision of our leaders uh, on the top of it, the Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the president of United Arab Emirates, and also Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, vice president, prime minister, ruler of Dubai, in which he stated that human beings, their ideas, innovations, dreams, connections are the capital of the future. And wherever they go, for sure, they will do changes in the place which they will, they will be present. And therefore, the vision of the five ministries really concentrated on the from and as an outcome are reflected positively from the vision of our leaders. And we would like to make sure that everyone will be able to live in peace and safety in this beautiful country, the United Arab Emirates, and to bring their investment. And also, if you have your investment here, to expand and to be the, 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 the center or the international center for the rest of the countries in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I was so happy to join you at this conference. And really, we look forward of the outcome of this very inform uh, informative gathering. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alamiri, for your insightful keynotes. Great introduction to the first State of Science Index for the UAE. As forward at 3M, we believe that science is the process of pursuing knowledge about the world and how things in the world work through logically get observing, experimenting, and applying truths on a particular subject. At 3M, we apply science to life. Just a few words around the evolution of the State of Science Index and its methodology. The State of Science Index, SOCI, is a third party independent research study commissioned by 3M and conducted annually for the past four years to track attitudes toward science. The 2021 study was fielded from February to March and includes 17 countries. As I said earlier, making it the largest data pool to date. It is the second edition of SOCI conducted during the pandemic. For the last four years, 3M has conducted the annual state of science index to track attitudes to science through multi-country original research. The second wave called the 2020 pandemic pause was fielded in July, August, 2020 period, about six months into the pandemic. This is when we have decided to pilot the survey in the UAE to gauge local interest. This research captures a snapshot of how science is perceived in this moment in time against the backdrop of the coronavirus outbreak. It enables us to understand current attitudes to science against sentiment captured after the pandemic. From the methodology standpoint, you can retrieve all details directly online. Just a few thoughts here. 20 minute survey, combination of online and offline interviews, and a sample of 1,000 people surveyed by country, setting the scheme. Six months into the pandemic, science became increasingly relevant to our lives, catapulting the image, image of science into a positive territory not seen since we started tracking the state of science four years ago. Events that unfolded between our last survey filled in summer of 2020, and this survey of January 2021 provide context. By the fall of 2020, experts prepared many regions of the world for a seasonal escalation of virus transmission. With it came a surge in cases and the realization that we still had a long, long road ahead of us. Winter brought new mutations and for many corresponding return to lockdown measures. The fear of the unknown was tempered only by news about vaccine trials. By the time of these surveys, find, uh, fieldings, vaccine distribution was underway. 
signaling an antidote to the virus. 87% in UAE believe that science is bringing hope for the future. But what happened next? As we acclimated um, to living under the cons uh, constraints of a global pandemic, would our newfound trust in science continue to thrive? Or would pandemic fatigue set, set in and return us to a state of indifference? A year into the pandemic, five key themes underpin the state of science index in 2021. Hope is the defining sentiment for science. Image of, of science, which we measure against trust, remains at the highest level. 90% in the United Arab Emirates trust science today, consistent with the 2020 pandemic pool survey results. Next topic, STEM equity. A renewed focus on STEM because of the pandemic. Three quarters are more inspired to pursue STEM career in the United Arab Emirates. 79%, significantly above the 60% of global average, which is great to see. In terms of sustainability, we are more aware and science is part of the solution. The pandemic has made many in the UAE more environmentally conscious, more so than other countries around the world, with more than four in five report the COVID-19 pandemic has made them more env environmentally conscious. 86% in the UAE responded positively versus just 77% globally. Again, great to see. As, a, uh, as the attention turns to vaccines, people in the UAE are counting on science to help restore and rejuvenate their lives and enable their road to recovery. What we found through the majority believes that science will save us from COVID-19 and 88% of the respondent in UAE uh, think that science will make it possible to return to a pre-pandemic normal in 2021. In the UAE, this hopefulness includes priorities that science can solve for beyond health, such as sustainability, and STEM equity gaps. A newfound enthusiasm for science in youth suggests that the image, image of science may continue to improve as younger generations age. 89% recognize scientists as being critical to our future well being in light of the pandemic. 83% agree young people are more engaged in science and science-related issues than ever before. 81% believe that during the pandemic, scientists and medical professionals are inspiring a new generation to pursue a science-based career in the future, significantly above global average of 62%. Again, UAE score is at 81%. Parents, 84%, and millennials aged um, 25 to 40 years, 84% are even more likely to believe this. Large majority feels that the pandemic has made them more environmentally conscious. Again, 86% in the UAE versus just 77% globally. Let's put back things into context. Science has influenced our behavior during the pandemic. Hate and scores for science across the board may be influenced our behaviors during the pandemic. Large majority confirms they always take the following actions to stay safe during the pandemic. 90% agree that in order to contain the spread, people actions should follow scientific advice. 88% agree vaccines are essential part of how science addressing addresses public health concerns. 86% agree most people they know are following scientific advice to stay safe during the pandemic. The UAE 
continues to be attuned to the impact um, science has on the world. 82% believe that there are negative consequences for society if people do not value science. And globally, there is a trend which shows the prevalence of science as being very, very important to everyday life. The graph here shows a trend line since the inception of SOCI. The pandemic has renewed focus on STEM in the UAE, especially among younger generations. Near, nearly all agree that the world needs more people pursuing STEM-related careers. 98% says that. Due to the pandemic, three quarters are more inspired to pursue a STEM career. 79% in the UAE versus just 60% globally. Four out of five believe that during the pandemic, scientists, medical professionals are inspiring a new generation to pursue science-based careers in the future. In the UAE, 81% versus 62% globally. Younger generations, 84% among adult millennials and parents over-index on this belief. Increasing diversity in STEM is a top priority. 82% agree it is important to increase diversity and inclusion in STEM fields versus 88% global. Both men and women agree that more needs to be done to address STEM inequities women face. Top three things science will achieve with more diversity in STEM fields. Greater global collaboration will be taking place between scientists. More innovative ideas will be arise. And new and improved approaches to existing research techniques will be made available more broadly. As a leader, a father of two, and a science backgrounded by education, I also share a strong belief that corporations have a role to play in improving diversity in STEM fields. In UAE, 88% believe corporations should play a key role in improving diversity within STEM fields. Of those who believe corporations should be involved in supporting STEM education, the top actions corporations should uh, prioritize include enabling greater, greater global collaboration between scientists, rewarding kids and teachers who show passion for science, creating educational resources for teachers to use in science classes, providing grants and scholarships to underrepresented students, hosting programs like internships, summer camps, and workshops to help students pursue STEM careers. The pandemic has made many in the UAE more environmentally conscious, as I mentioned already earlier. More than four in five confirmed this fact, 86% versus just 77% globally. Across all generations, people believe we should follow the science to help make the world more sustainable. 89% says that. There is a sense of urgency around climate change. A strong majority agree better solution to mitigate climate change need to be put in place immediately. 88% confirm that. Here again, corporations are ex expected to help. 89% of the survey in the United Arab Emirates believe that it is necessary for corporations to do their part in combating climate change. The top four things companies should prioritize for a more sustainable future are using renewable energy sources to power their facilities, using recycled and renewable materials in products development, reducing the amount of plastic used in products, and re reducing waste created by the facilities. We seem more likely to stand up for science. There is a jump from 20% pre-pandemic survey in 2020 
to 75% in 2021, who is willing to defend science when someone is questioning it. It's a great, great progress and a very significant improvement. In conclusion, perhaps, the most important thing that we can keep in mind is that science is viewed as essential to shaping, strengthening, and improving the future of the United Arab Emirates. 88% believe that investments in science make the country stronger. 86% believe that the UAE economy will further improve if more people pursue STEM-related careers. Collaboration between public and private sectors to advance science is overwhelmingly supported, 89% positive. People in the UAE most want corporations to prioritize preparing for the next pandemic, indicating a concern for future outbreaks. Let me share an example. Over the past year, 3M has joined the United Nations to raise awareness of epidemic preparedness using science-based information and best practices for disease prevention and response. Most recently, 3M released a white paper on best practices for personal protective equipment, PPE stockpiling programs. UAE sees cross-border and cross-sector collaboration as essential to scientific advancement. 88% feel that countries should collaborate to create solutions based on science to address major challenges. And 89% believe that there should be more collaboration across public and private sectors to address science. Before we proceed to the panel discussion, I would like to introduce you Karan Aziri, the Managing Director of the American Chamber of Commerce in Dubai. I would like to thank Kara for accepting to moderate the panel. Kara, it's over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing these great insights from the State of Science Index. Uh, Dr. Alamiri, your insights also well received. In my 29 years in the UAE, I have seen and witnessed a great deal of collaboration between the UAE government and the business community itself. It is one of the key things that we look for, forward to continuing to watch grow and thrive as the UAE continues into its 50th year and beyond. And we're excited to be here this morning to discuss this with some of the greater minds of the science community here in the region. Um, we believe that the investment in innovations that mitigate the effects of climate change and the removal of barriers to quality STEM education at AmCham are underrepresented for the underrepresented can be resolved through public-private partnership. And we look forward to that further exploration within the organization. In fact, in 2019, we committed to sending uh, with our partners at the Dubai Air Show four young Emirati students and two uh, escorts off to space camp in the US. So whether it's space or healthcare, we are very committed and the American community is here to support the growth and exponential good things happening in the UAE that, as best we can. So without further ado, I will introduce our panel, Camilla Cruz Derlarker from 3M, Vice President of R&D Operations for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Mr. Jad Batar, Managing Director and Partner Healthcare for the Boston Consulting Group. Issan Anabatawi, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Marketing Officer for Microsoft UAE and Dr. Patrick Nowak, Executive Director, Future Foresight and Imagination at the Dubai Future Foundation. Welcome everyone. I think let's start with uh, one of the questions that we just discussed in detail. Jad, there's a profound interconnection between science, STEM and healthcare technology. Do you think the science has fostered healthcare? How do you think science has fostered healthcare technology? What leaps has healthcare taken to improve the lives of people? Beyond the COVID situation, if you don't mind, we just heard a lot about that. So one of the key concerns that I know we've discussed as an organization is beyond COVID, where, where are we and what leaps has healthcare taken? 
Thank you for the question. And uh, again, uh, I think medicine and healthcare is one of uh, basically one of the foundation of medicine and healthcare is uh, is then specifically the sciences, the biological sciences. So. Uh, what we look at from the, uh, I would say, start of the evolution of medicine, especially in the last 100 years, uh, biology was a foundational uh, driver of that. And uh, when we look at the impact of uh, this from, uh, I would say, the improved in expected uh, age, expected life uh, expectancy and uh, improvement in quality of life. But lately, if I look at the last decade, we see the impact of uh, technology, specifically information technology and digitizing healthcare. So if we look beyond uh, COVID and we look at the future, we can see improvement not only in, I would say, the direct impact of healthcare, but also the management uh, of healthcare. So I would, I would highlight a couple of these uh, technologies. One is everything related to remote uh, monitoring. So you really don't need to be visiting your doctor to check if something is happening and basically get a diagnostic. Ideally in the very uh, near future, what you will be on, you will be constantly on uh, with devices capturing a lot of your uh, data and basically being able to forecast and predict potential health issues and be able to intervene early on and prevent some of those diseases. This will be really a revolutionary for healthcare. We don't need to wait for somebody to develop a disease or a condition to be able to deal with these and try to cure disease. We focus on actually preventing disease and this will have a tremendous impact. The second thing I would say is actually an improvement in managing healthcare. Today, with all the advances we've seen across sciences, healthcare is still a very fragmented, very silo-based uh, industry. Uh, very little is integrated. And with uh, the improvement in different fields, we're gonna see a, a major impact on how healthcare will be managed, a more focus on patients. So when we look traditionally at healthcare, it was mainly doctor focused, caregiver focused, and we're gonna see an evolution towards a, care, a patient focused or an individual focused, where we will be able to design the system around the patient and not only thinking about improvement in healthcare, but also improvement in satisfaction and looking at a patient more as a consumer and trying to improve a 360 view of the patient, not rather only uh, the healthcare view of the patient. So these are two things that we should be seeing in the near future that will dramatically change healthcare and their foundation is the different uh, STEM fields that are involved in healthcare. Thank you. Uh, Isan, I think you might be the next person to call on after that, after that lovely comment. Uh, I believe that Microsoft is well known for its mission to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. How important is science to bring his mission to life, what is Microsoft doing to advance STEM and other critical subjects? And how is that going to filter into what Jad just commented on? Because I think it plays a very important role there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kara. And uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be with, with you today. Uh, so again, if, if, you, if we draw on, on the comments from, uh, from Jan and also what's happening uh, around us in, in the past uh, nearly two years, I think it's safe to say that, uh, that every business is really becoming a digital business. Uh, and uh, foundationally to that, right, we, we all know that science uh, is core to any technology we use today, right? It's rooted, it's rooted in science whether that's mathematics or you know, engineering or, or physics or, or material science or coding, right? From, from the devices you use every day uh, to the magic of, of this call we're on, right? It's, it's, it's all rooted in science. So I think it's, it's probably more important than ever. So that's definitely one lens um, we we're aware of as a company, as, a, as a, one of the big tech players uh, around. Uh, what we're doing on our side is to make sure we have an industry approach to the R&D that we do. Uh, so some of the areas that my, my, my colleague touched on, whether it's uh, innovation in healthcare, uh, innovation in remote work, uh, in areas that the world needs more than ever, 
uh, and we, you know, we channel our R&D and, and resources towards that. The other thing we're doing is how do we encourage more, more young people to embrace careers in STEM, right? So um, I'll give you a few examples. If you think of what's happening in education today, one of, one of, one of the tools that we've seen be effective is things like my, Minecraft for education, is how do you gamify something like STEM and make it more interesting uh, to teach kids, you know, maths, coding skills, uh, and beyond specific skills, also the ability to critically think, problem solve, be creative, right? Because those are the foundations of any scientific field. How do you teach them really to love to learn, you know, think on their own, uh, problem solve, think critically. Uh, so those are things we try to do through programs like Minecraft um, and, and others that help teach kids and, and young, young learners uh, these core skills. Uh, we also have specific uh, skilling investments that we do in the region and in the UE specifically um, that help again reskill the market and make sure that we're investing in the areas that make more the most sense uh, for the economy. So again, in the UE, as an example, uh, we've we had uh, significant partnerships on areas uh, in retail, in aviation, in healthcare, uh, in financial services uh, that again all will move the needle on those digitally transformed industries with again with with science engineering and coding uh, as a as a core skills um, and uh, maybe one more thing i'd like to add is how do we bring more diversity uh, into stem fields that's another thing we deeply think about again how do we encourage girls and young women to embrace careers in stem uh, one thing we found based on our research is the more role models we have in this field uh, the more uh, young people will be encouraged to embrace careers in STEM, but also the more relevant applications we can give them in areas that are interesting for them. And I think in the current context, we can find a lot of areas, given that every, everything today is heavily depending on digital uh, digital technology. Uh, so that that is probably a huge opportunity. And I think if you followed the announcements that just came out yesterday from the Minister of AI uh, and, and, and innovation in the country, uh, how do you again attract you know girls specifically and female coders uh, to really embrace uh, innovation and STEM, uh, but more obviously more, um, also coders at large. So that that's been an explicit, I think, priority for the country, and we are we are a partner to them uh, in this again as a as a as a technology player. Uh, the other thing we did is uh, bringing uh, global assets closer to the market. So I think one thing that we've seen help. Uh, increase the uptake as our recent investments in uh, cloud data centers in the UE, right? This, uh, this helps uh, make sure there's a center of gravity uh, for talent, center of gravity for innovation. Uh, they've been in market for two years, and I can tell you over the past two years, uh, the interest from the ecosystem uh, has, has been elevated. So we see uh, more startups that are talking to us to leverage those assets, which again, by design, brings more people in the tech sector and more people in scientific fields to the market, largely because, again, they realize that many of the industries in the market will require data residency, will require you know, cloud technology closer to home, uh, will require sort of a hyperscaler uh, to be operating in the market. So again, that's another lens that I think has helped uh, attract uh, you know, startups, people in the ecosystem uh, to help us really invigorate uh the field uh in, in the market so that that's uh you know on, on our side some of the things we're doing wow uh, just a few <laughs> <laughs> quite impressive um and and i look forward to watching it un unfold and and thrive in the uae honestly um along those lines uh patrick societies are revolutionizing with modern technology and digital transformation um, is science an integral part of the industrial revolution 4.0 and how is it enabling societies to move forward i i suggest there's probably no one more in tune than the dubai future foundation to tell us about this so please Great, thank you for that question. Um, look, uh, within the Dubai Future Foundation, we run the World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So we're an affiliate center here. Uh, some of the areas that we look at include specifically, uh, you know, thinking of medicine that we've discussed at length here this, uh, during this session, uh, genomics, but we also look at uh, Internet of Things, uh, blockchain, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, etc. I think 
because it's commonly understood and accepted that we live in the era of the fourth industrial revolution, technology, science, um, engineering and maths really are at the heart of this. Uh, you cannot imagine anything in life uh, that has anything to do with food, um, technology, travel, health, um, education that is not driven um, or touched by, by, um, by these areas. So it is absolutely integral. One of the big questions that we're, or a number of the big questions that we're trying to assess um, is uh, what's the best uh, possible use for society of these technologies? So technology in a sense is like a tool, right? So um, going back in the history of humankind, um, we've always used tools, whether it was um, a hammer, um, a chisel, um, plowing devices, we're using tools and all of those tools can be used well or not so well. So we're trying to assess um, how we can make sure that artificial intelligence or, uh, or blockchain or uh, um, genomics, for example, are used in the best possible ways. Um, and to do that, we try to identify how these tools might be used going forward uh, in the future and next years and decades, but also just really to make sure that that, that to the benefit of humanity. Um, one of the things that we've touched on during the conversation so far is really that point of um, diversity in science, uh, technology, um, and mathematics, and engineering. And so the, the reason diversity, I think, is so incredibly important as the fourth industrial revolution is developing is because we need to make sure that the tools that we have develop and regulate are implicitly um, working to the aims that we hope that, uh, that they're going to be applied in. And so in other words, you know, we've all heard about uh, bias going into coding, for example, or bias going into AI. How do we make sure that uh, we don't implicitly or unwittingly um, include biases uh, in, in these technologies? And so one of the ways, I think one of the most important ways to achieve that is to ensure that there is um, the right kind of diversity in the um, developers of these technologies. Coming to, and just I wanted to squeeze in one, one word here, um, and perhaps uh, it's a little bit of an outlier in this conversation, but I think it's important for us to address. Um, and it's really important to understand that uh, we are, to a large extent, this is the global we, uh, we are users or consumers of science. And I think one really important uh, step uh, that we're seeing is being, is, is being made and is, is being encouraged at the moment is to move from being mere or predominantly users and consumers of science to move increasingly toward becoming producers of science. There's a lot that's happening in terms of how we produce science, how do we, how do we produce produce good science? How do we re verify that the science that we produce is good? Uh, and it's also uh, of universal applicability. So I just wanted to uh, make that point at this stage. Great point. Thank you very much. Camilla, um, um, humbly bring you into the conversation as a woman of science. Do you think the field of science was underappreciated before, particularly among girls and, and um, women? And how has the mindset um, and perspectives of people changed towards the field over the years? And is it getting all the credit that it was due? Um, thank you, Carl, for the, the question. And good morning, everyone. Oh, I, I definitely think it was underappreciated. First of all, think about how scientists are pictured in, are pictured in movies, books, comics, uh, they are usually this crazy guy, isolated, wearing weird clothes in, in hair, uh, surrounded by computer or laboratory slab, exploding things around, uh, smelly. Uh, and when I say guy, I really mean it, right? There is never a girl or a woman picture in, in the movies or comics. Um, so... How is that supposed to inspire young generations? Uh, and, and what I think is that things are starting to change. First, uh, the pandemic approach us to scientists uh, made many understand, uh, understand that the scientific career goes way beyond what they see in this, in this media. It has also helped scientists to come closer to society talk in a language that is much more approachable and understandable. 
So in fact, uh, it works both ways, right? It works, uh, it, it helps young generations get closer to science, but it also makes scientists get closer to society. Um, and, and just to bring here maybe one data from, from our uh, SOZI um, studies, right? 90% of people interviewed in UAE declare that they trust science and almost the same amount believe that there are negative consequences for society if we don't value science and are willing to, people are willing to defend it to other people that are questioning it. Uh, Laszlo also brought this uh, in his presentation. Uh, interesting was also to observe that medical professionals professionals and scientists are nowadays more trusted than other professionals like teachers, journalists, and celebrities, which, which is great, right? People want to hear from them and not from their uh, loved celebrities. And they believe in science because they came to appreciate the scientific method and the evidence supporting scientific discovery. Uh, all in all, uh, these are very positive news for science. Indeed, they are. And, and you are so right about thinking when I think back about all of the science geeks that I see, they're never they're never girls. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good point, though, really, isn't it? Um, I think that it's great that the UAE has a female astronaut. They have female pilots. STEM is truly a place that women will have a home in the UAE. And I am proud that American business is here to be involved in that conversation. So Jad, um, there was an immense urgency and pressure to tackle um, the situation caused by the novel coronavirus. How has science played a critical role in identifying and also providing an immediate solution uh, to battle the situation? <laughs> Look, uh, science was all over the place. I think, again, uh, the ability to detect that a new form of virus has emerged was fundamental. Uh, being able to do traceability, and we're still in the midst of that, to try to understand where did this virus come from, and then trying to decode the virus and try to understand how we can uh, develop either a treatment or a vaccine for it was all uh, driven by science. But also, I think not only the hardcore healthcare uh, aspect, but if we look also at the policies that governments uh, decided to design and implement in response to this virus was a lot driven uh, by science and the fact of trying to understand which policies would have what kind of impact on the economy, on, so on society. So a lot of these uh, policies were also fundamentally driven by, let's call it some kind of science, at least some data underlying uh, these decisions. So if I look at some of the projects we've done across many countries across the globe, we were able to uh, identify a library of around 150 different policies that government could take to limit the spread of the, the disease and to also fight uh, the disease, but also the impact on these policies. So that were customized for each country. So we were able to build models uh, to assess and come up with scenarios of what could happen if we shut down the airports, if we shut down schools, if we close restaurants and so on and so forth. So there were a lot of options given to uh, governments to be able to deal with this virus. So. If I look back, you have the two aspects, the hardcore science, which is the medical side of uh, identifying the virus, decoding it, and trying to develop uh, technologies to deal with the virus, either from a vaccine perspective or from a treatment perspective, but also the whole public health uh, aspect, which uh, was driven by designing policies to allow uh, a, a proper or an optimal response. And you've seen, we've had, uh, different reactions to the virus. I take the two extremes, Sweden being one, where the philosophy was keep everything open and uh, things will take care of themselves. And I would say the more dramatic ones, uh, similar to the UK, where let's try to shut down everything 
and uh, try to save lives and not uh, focus on the economy now. So uh, while most of us might think that these policies were driven by politics, a lot of them were driven by science, by models, by scenario planning, uh, to be able to help decision maker make the right decisions. Absolutely. Um, and so you're, you always lead me into Issan. So Issan, uh, your CEO, Satya, Satya Nadella, has famously said that at the start of COVID-19, we have seen more digital transformation in two months than in the past two years. What have you seen the biggest impact in terms of techno technology technological leaps? Yeah, uh, thanks, Kara. And uh, yeah, and I, I still don't think that was an exaggeration. I actually think we've we've really seen seen that unfold, uh, and it continues to unfold uh, as we're still as we're still uh, living through this and, and dealing with this. Um, and I think there's really two overarching uh, trends that, that we see. The first one uh, you, you can think of as really remote everything, right? How, how did we really move to this notion of uh, doing things remotely at, uh, at the, in an instant? Uh, and that ranges from uh, you know, remote learning to remote working uh, to how people consume uh, entertainment, uh, how people network. Uh, and get get things done uh, across across the board. So that's sort of one uber trend uh, that we see. And obviously, in countries where we've we've seen great vaccination rates and a strong return to normalcy, there continues to be a hybrid uh, element to how people engage uh, and work and do things remotely. Uh, you know, I'm taking this call uh, from my my home office, uh, and you know, I, I yesterday I was in our physical office, which has returned to soft open, for example. So, so we see companies pivot uh, to whichever direction uh, th that suits them and allowing, you know, different industries have, a, you know, different needs uh, and they can sustain this in a sort of a hybrid and flexible uh, work, work environment, which we believe is here to stay. So if anything, how do we use technology to augment, uh, you know, human uh, creativity in this new reality that I think will, will be here to stay? Uh, while, of course, many industries would return would require almost a full return uh, to you know in-person engagement and physical engagement. So that sort of Uber Uber trend of remote everything. The other one, uh, the big trend we've seen is how do we use technology to really uh, accelerate uh, optimization across the board uh, and also digital transformation across the board. So and we see this in many places. We talked about healthcare. Uh, if you look at the role technology played. In, in many areas uh, that had to do with the pandemic response from vaccine actual development uh, to vaccine distribution, you know, across supply chains, uh, to you booking your appointment, to tracking your vaccination status, to now hopefully building a unified platform that we're still waiting for that countries agree on using blockchain or other technologies so that you can track the authenticity of both your test results, but also your vaccination status uh, so technology has been critical, right, in, in all aspects of, of this of this uh, of this chain, um, and we also saw industries that were on the fence of cloud transformation, digital adoption uh, accelerate. Uh, one notable example is financial services. So we've seen much more adoption of contact contactless payments, digital payments. Uh, you know, different ways to deal with your financial institution uh, that in the past you needed to be in, you know physically present. Uh, and obviously, we've seen acceleration across things like supply chain uh, and also all businesses thinking of resiliency, right? If tomorrow something else happens, how do we sustain our operations? How do we really use technology to be much more resilient, much more operationally ready uh, to deal with, with the next uh, incident? Hopefully, hopefully nothing that we all have to deal with. Uh, so those are some of the things that we've seen. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention is also, I think, an amplification uh, of the role technology plays in reflecting uh, the, the diversity of people that use it, right? So one of the things we've seen, for example, uh, is people with disabilities. Uh, those were one of the biggest impacted communities in the pandemic because we realized that we were not really ready to cater for many, many things. So, and that's an area we, would, as Microsoft, were deeply passionate about. So if you think of uh, technologies we provide through AI, for cognition, you know, for vision, uh, for hearing, uh, for neurodiversity, uh, mental health uh, and well-being. That's another area, by the way, that's been magnified uh, throughout this pandemic is the importance of well-being and mental health uh, across its full spectrum. 
uh, and how do we really help people uh, that, that dealt with this differently? And how do we also, you know, emphasize the importance of well-being, uh, both for you know for everybody and also people that deal with with you know, real issues across the spectrum uh, that we can use technology to help. Um, so that that I think has been a, a, a something that's been magnified, and I think it's a positive impact. Uh, that we all hopefully can continue to engage on and, and emphasize. Absolutely. I just, I want to point out that my notes say that this next question says, arguably, uh, in the context of the ongoing pandemic, we're arguably more dependent on technology. So I think for, for the sake of it, we're going to note that we, we have all agreed on this call in the short time we've already addressed concerns that we're, we are more dependent on technologies than ever before. Um, but this may pose a challenge to those who cannot access these technologies easily. How is Microsoft ensuring that nobody is left behind? Not necessarily, um, I, I appreciate what you said about people with disabilities, but around the globe, uh, you know, I saw it, a donut shop up the street uh, during when I was here very early in the pandemic in the US, I saw a donut shop say, you know, we are closed, but you can come in and use our internet, they said to kids, because we have this available, come in and you can have class here. It was all socially distanced and very cool. And that's in America. So what about countries that don't necessarily have the infrastructure to be as technolo technology focused um, during this? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so thanks for the follow up question, Kara. So look, critically important. I think there's a number of things we, we, we try to do, not just on our own, but obviously engaging with other big tech players and with, you know, with industries and with governments so that we have a, a holistic uh, approach to that. Um, so, for example, if you're a consumer today, not a business, there's a range of things you can access uh, today that are either at no cost uh, or nominal cost. So, for example, uh, if you think of uh, email, if you think of collaboration tools, uh, if you think of the consumer version of Microsoft Teams, which was critical uh, for people to communicate uh, today and, and during the pandemic, those tools are all are already made available to millions and millions of consumers uh, that, that we offer. Uh, what we did early in the pandemic is even if you were a commercial uh, business, we gave you, uh, I think it was three months or six months, I can't remember, of access to Teams as an example, uh, access to uh, parts of Office 365 just to help with that business continuity that we know many customers needed, regardless of whether they had a subscription uh, uh, or not uh, as commercial as commercial entities. Uh, so that's on the software side. So we continue to see what can we do to offer access, what can we do to lower the barrier of you know to entry, whether you're a consumer or or a business. Uh, obviously, in education, a lot of these tools that I mentioned for students are also offered. Uh, through their institution at no cost to the students. Uh, so if you're a student and you want to do learning, uh, you get a lot of tools through your institution that are either as a, at, at nominal cost or uh, you know in many cases at, at no cost at all. Uh, and then in other countries, for example, in, in, in many places in Africa, we partner with telcos and we partner with government uh, to use non-traditional technologies to offer access. One of the most popular has been uh, something called TV white space uh, technology. So in places that are remote, uh, where you don't have access to the internet, when you don't have traditional coverage, uh, we use uh, literally the TV white space, uh, which is much more available. Uh, we also deployed uh, technologies in remote areas, uh, again, in partnership with telcos that you leverage 5G networks, uh, leverage, uh, not 5G, leverage mobile networks <laughs> in, in, in many areas uh, that are more available than traditional wired or fiber uh, or broadband networks uh, in many of these places. Uh, low cost devices uh, in partnership with our hardware uh, hardware partners. Uh, for example, in many countries, mobile is the first device that people use uh, versus a tablet or a PC. Uh, so you find most of our technologies from Office 365 to Teams and others have a mobile uh, you know, app so that you allow access in these low end, uh, much more available uh, devices uh, in many countries around the world. Uh, and the lastly, as I mentioned, how do you make technology also inclusive, right? Through to things like accessibility uh, and, and solving for that uh, through AI and through other innovations in computer vision and, 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 and cloud computing uh, at large. So those are some of the things 
uh, that we continue to do to just have equitable and hopefully much more inclusive access. But of course, if you ask me, there's a lot more work to be done. And I think uh, this is an area we will continue to hopefully uh, progress on. Thank you, Hassan. I knew a bit about that, but not uh, as comprehensively as you've just explained. So I'm excited to see it and hear it. And um, and I expect that one of the places that the results of that might show up is over at the Dubai Future Foundation. Um, when you guys think about bringing people into the UAE who are coders now or uh, have learned other um, you know, technology-based applications that they want to bring and implement here in the UAE. Uh, how is that? That's a positive change in the world. How are people um, approaching the field with an open mind? And what is, I know the UAE is looking at bringing all sorts of coding folks into the UAE. What have you seen happen over at Dubai Future Foundation? Well, look, I think it's a really interesting and important point um, about bringing in people uh, from specific areas of expertise, of, of STEM expertise. And that's because when we look back at um, who, who was who in STEM, um, and uh, colleague, uh, the, my colleague on this panel who, who discussed earlier the need for diversity has mentioned this quite clearly, that it's been mostly white men. Um, so that's on the one hand. The other thing that we need to be aware of is that recognition comes to a handful. So if you look at the most recent Nobel Prizes, Nobel Prize in Medicine, for example, given out last year, it was to three men uh, for their work on discovering uh, the hepatitis C virus. What we often forget is that when you see these leaders, these, these people who are recognized for very important work, thousands of people have actually contributed to that. And so what we're looking for um, is to be able to recognize people who make a massive difference and, to, and who contribute to development of new fields, uh, development of new knowledge, development of new insights um, in an area which is highly, highly competitive and which historically has recognized only a handful of people. So again, uh, as an analogy, uh, we all know bio and tech nowadays, thanks to the um, vaccine that they've developed and now distributed with Pfizer. And we've all heard about uh, Ugur Sahin, uh, Sahin and Özlem Türeci, who run BioNTech. But we may not know that BioNTech is a company of more than 1,300 people. And so within BioNTech, much like within any knowledge generating uh, science and technology generating organization, whether it's um, a university, whether it's a company, whether it's a government entity, there are large numbers of people who we need to identify for the contributions that they make and the skills that they bring. So that's, you know, you mentioned earlier about um, finding people within AI and coding. So we really need to identify the people who are emerging, who bring very unique points of view and very unique insights and skill, um, even though they may not be the Nobel Prize winners of the day or the most cited um, publishers of the day. And just as an aside, um, the Royal Society, which is uh, the UK's um, science, uh, basically science establishment, um, are increasingly looking to changing uh, recruitment patterns and recruitment structures and the way recruiters look at scientists by revamping the CV so that the CVs are not just based on the kinds and numbers of publications, but really are looking to what makes a scientist, what makes the whole scientist. So what kind of person and skill set and background and experience and team playing uh, capabilities does an individual have that make them successful in their field of work? So, we're, you know, I think the key going forward is being able to um, to accomplish all of those things. And just one last thing, I think we've got a, we've got a pandemic credit or a kind of an, uh, a thing that has developed uh, as the um, uh, diagnostics and the vaccine for COVID were being developed. And that is the extent of global collaboration that we've observed, which has led to all these breakthroughs has not been seen before. So this is hopefully something that we will be able to continue globally as a global community to ensure that um, insights, research, knowledge, and science are shared uh, across countries, but also across disciplines and fields so that collectively we can all benefit from that. 
Thank you. I, I completely agree. And I love that the diversity theme keeps coming up in this conversation. Uh, many, not many years ago, not many years ago even, but several years ago, we looked at uh, hosting within the American Chamber, a women in STEM uh, group discussion. And there weren't that many women in STEM in the UAE. So it's kind of uh, a, a small club. So I, I like that we continue to focus on that diversity and, and bringing in women. Um, Camilla, um, in times, you know, when the pandemic was raging, why do you think people's attitudes towards science changed? What, what was the selling point that made people feel uh, that they needed to really follow the science. There's been much a public debate in America, of course, around um, following the science or not following the science and what is actually the science and things like that. So what do you think was the driving force behind, as Laszlo reported, the, the fact that people are now willing to defend that, that people should follow the science and understand where it is? Uh, this is a very uh, important question. Great question, actually. Uh, so as, as Laszlo mentioned at the beginning, Riem has been tracking the world's perception of science since 2018, when we first conducted the State of Science Index survey in 10 countries around the world. At that time, 86% of the people who were interviewed said they trusted science, but this number uh, jumped to 91% this year. So uh, an increase in uh, five percentage points. And, and in fact, the trust in scientists also increased by seven percentage points. So we see a shift in, in how people are perceiving science and how people are perceiving uh, scientists. I, I believe that uh, one of the main benefits is that uh, people are more aware of science and people are more openly discussing it, consuming information about science. People are looking for where do they, where can they find trusted information about science, um, either through reading, listening, watching to programs, hearing to podcasts. People are just open to consume it, which I didn't. I, I don't think it existed before. Maybe in in a few clusters, but not as broadly as we are seeing it today. So the perception in the past was that science was only for experts, uh, only for those who who were really smart and who were in that field, right? And the pandemic has approached people to science. And, and just maybe one fun fact here, right? Prior to the pandemic, when, when we made uh, this, this survey, when we asked people if science had an impact in their daily lives, only 44% of the respondents believed that science had an impact in their daily lives. And this from people responding through their smartphones or their computers, right? <laughs> Which are basically science uh, created, right? So this number of course has increased now to 56%, an incredible 12% uh, 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 point. So it's amazing really how we see the shift happening uh, live. It is an amazing shift, but it's still 56. I mean, I can't get through a, you know, an hour without my phone, my, my smartwatch reminding me, oh, it's time to move. You haven't moved in a minute. So I, on the hour, I think science is involved in my life. So I love that. Jad, um, obviously technology has been a life changer through the pandemic. Um, what sort of initiatives um, have been taken you know, through technology that you see as critical when trying to help people, uh, you know, very early in the pandemic get through, you know, when so many people were ending up in the hospital, what sort of initiatives do you think were key in technology? Early in the pandemic, you mean? Yeah, that helped people, you know, sort of te technology from a technology standpoint. Hmm. Interesting question. Uh, 
Look, if I, if I recall well the early days of technology, I think one of the most important aspects was uh, communication and basically raising awareness. So definitely their technology played a very important role to explain uh, what was happening, to explain what was expected. Uh, if you remember well, uh, at least in the UAE, it was only in mid-January when we started hearing about it, and it took about uh, less than a couple of months to go into the shutdown. It was around March 10 or 11. So uh, during this time, it was really about uh, public health authorities collecting data, gathering data, and being able to communicate and raising awareness uh, to uh, the population about this disease, about the expected behaviors and changes uh, that would be coming. But also, it was the data collection uh, from, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from hospitals and other places. So epidemiological surveillance systems that was able to gather this information and try to make sense of it. The ability, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the supply chains to put them all in place to be able to start stockpiling and basically uh, procuring uh, needed PEPs and needed tests. Uh, if you remember in the early days, we had a dramatic shortage of many of these items and uh, technology was essential in identifying sources for these uh, supplies and to make sure to be able to deliver them in the right location. So technology played a very important role, I would say, in the early days, uh, at least from a uh, population perspective, but also in the back offices where uh, the big pharma and the small startup went full gear into trying to uh, analyze this virus, trying to uh, uh, decode it and try to start identifying what could be done about this uh, virus. So all of these were very important uh, initiatives supported dramatically uh, by technology. One point I wanted to highlight, Kara, if you allow me, is that uh, the whole point of this, uh, I would say, discussion is to highlight the importance of science in our lives today and in our future. But I think also science, where we stand today with science, uh, we need also to apply those of science to our scientific endeavor. I think there are three points that I would like to share. I think science needs to improve in three ways. It needs to move beyond, I would say, the ivory towers where it is located today in the labs and in these sophisticated places and go back into our everyday life like it used to be, I would say, in Socrates' time or Aristotle times. It really needs to become a something that anybody can use and uh, adopt on a daily basis. It does not need to be in a very sophisticated multi-million dollar lab with very sophisticated PhDs. Uh, the second point, I think science, the way we've been adopting it for the last couple hundred years, was a Cartesian view of science, a very reductionist view of science. And I think we need also to go beyond this reductionist view of science and become a more systemic view of science that embraces more uh, society, more the environment, uh, and more differences, and try to re limit the reductionist approve, approach of science. And the third point, I think we need to integrate ethics more closely with science. We cannot separate these two fields. As one of the topics we discussed today, being able to uh, involve more women uh, in science, but there are a lot of other ethical approaches, ethical problems with science today. And we need to have ethics, I think, closely integrated with science. These are the three points I think if we can push science beyond where it is today, it would really have a major impact or, or further impact on our societies. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, actually. Um, and I think that um, uh, we will, maybe Camilla, if you don't mind, give you the last question as we wrap up. Um, hope is becoming a defining feature of science, right? People are being exposed more and they're understanding more. Why do you think people have started associating hope with science? Are they becoming more aware about the importance of science in STEM generally, and they are seeing what it can help them achieve, or what do you think? Um, this is a very intriguing effect of the pandemic, right? 87% um, of people in UAE refer that science give them hope about the future. But this feeling of hope stands beyond the pandemic and beyond health. 
It also includes sentiments that science will improve sustainability and stem equity gaps. More than this, we also saw that the pandemic had a positive effect on the image of careers in science, especially in the medical sector. 81% of the people interviewed in UAE responded that during the pandemic, scientists and medical professionals inspired a new generation to pursue a science-based career in the future. And this number is even higher for millennials, so 85% of them. I believe this will have a lasting effect as this generation ages and become themselves scientists and encourage their own children to pursue a career in science. Uh, it is also our role right, to continue to uh, reduce the gap between uh, the, the science and the perception of science and approach it to, to the common population. Right? Uh, and we also saw an effect on sustainability, as, as I mentioned before. The majority of people interviewed also report that they uh, became much more environmentally conscious which again could have a wonderful long lasting effect improving the lives of all of humanity. So again, just summarizing, um, it, uh, it, it is interesting how, how the pandemic is increasing hope and is connecting hope to science and science is becoming much more prevalent in the perception of the society. Good things come from bad things as well, right? I mean, so yeah. there you go. Um, we're growing as a society, learning and um, evolving. Um, so I think that's pretty much all of my questions. If anyone has a final comment, Isan, I know you have a timeline. Is there a final comment from you? Yeah, thank you, Kara. Look, I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you for the, the great moderation. Maybe a last thing on my side that, that I think is relevant in this context. And again, if you think at the global view, at the, at the macro view, at the number of challenges that the world uh, is dealing with right from a from a ongoing pandemic to you know climate change and, and extreme weather and you know social injustice and many other issues i was reading a book uh, by one of my favorite authors recently his name is, is adam grant many of you may be familiar with him uh, the book's name is uh, is think again and, and he talks about uh four distinct thinking styles right he th he talks about you know uh, preacher, prosecutor, politician, and scientist. And he thinks, you know, some, and we've sometimes fallen in one of the four. He says, if you're thinking like a preacher, if you're in preacher mode, uh, you're convinced you're right. Uh, so, you know, you're trying to really argue your point and, 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 and win over others. Um, if you're a prosecutor, you're trying to prove somebody else wrong. Uh, if you're a politician, obviously you're trying to win over an audience. And uh, finally, he argues, if you're, if you're thinking like a scientist, you more, more often than not, you favor humility over pride, uh, curiosity over conviction. Uh, you look for reasons why you may be wrong, not just reasons why you may be right. So I think in this global contest, for me, we probably need scientific thinking across the board more than ever. I think if we're, if we're really going to progress on some of these macro global issues, uh, that really resonated for me. So I think that, that thinking style and how do we really all try to think more uh, with that mindset, I think it's probably more important than ever. Uh, so I just felt like felt like sharing that I had, uh, something I've been reading and I, I felt it's relevant. I, so thank uh, thank you. you. I've noted that down. I'll be reading that book. Patrick, I'm sorry, I have one actual final question for you then, if you don't mind sharing that, uh, answering that, and then giving me your final thoughts. The pandemic has affected the lives of people by and large. How has the field of science proven to be trustworthy in handling the crisis? And how have the changing trends brought by the pandemic uh, impacted, but brought by pandemic being impacted by it? Well, look, I think the, 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 the central question that we've, uh, to an extent, uh, been grappling with during this conversation is um, trust, right? So how do we trust science to how do we trust the practice of science? Someone has mentioned the scientific method. How do we trust the products of science? Um, and it, th there's different ways to, I think, uh, be able to achieve that in terms of the vaccine that's been developed and the diagnostics that have been developed during the uh, pandemic. It is really uh, these products these products prove themselves um, time and time again. Um, and I think the, the, the reason that we are able to accept the, uh, the products of science is because 
of a very rigorous method, which is not just the scientific method, but also the method to ensure that um, concepts or knowledge that is being created goes through a, a process of, of verification by peers. So, you know, the burden of proof is on the people who develop new knowledge. So if I develop a new idea, a new insight, new science, I have to demonstrate to the people who know at least as much as me or hopefully better, more, um, that what I'm saying holds true under the conditions that um, I'm, I'm saying this. So that's number one. And the second thing is, you know, science is not just, I find something in the lab that works. Uh, so we roll it out to, to billions of people, but instead there's that verification process of clinical trials, uh, of approvals, et cetera, to make sure that the, the, the science that is being turned into a technology and an application uh, is, is safe as well as effective. And so once all of those building blocks within the science and technology um, continuum exist, um, and we believe and we know we can trust them, then I think that level of trust, uh, that, that, that burden of proof that, that needs to be overcome uh, has been achieved. So I think the pandemic, even though there's, uh, there's debate uh, among some people, I think the, 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 the pandemic and the science that has come out of the pandemic um, have shown that science is, is a trustworthy field that can produce um, incredibly helpful and uh, ultimately vital products um, on, on a, on a, on, in a very timely uh, in a t very timely fashion. So as I said earlier, you know, nowhere in history have we seen the speed with which science has developed insight, knowledge and products for a new pathway. Camilla, any final comments from you? Thank you all so much for your time. Oh, I second everything my colleagues have, have spoken and their final messages. I think uh, it is our role, right? We are, as scientists or in the field of science, uh, to, to bridge that gap, to, to help approach science, uh, not in an arrogant way, but really helping the public understand and relate and, and perceive uh, how science can change their lives, but also how can how do can how they can play a role in science as well, right? So I think this opens an amazing opportunity for us. The the what we have seen throughout the pandemic uh, shows us that if we don't take the chance now, we might miss a, a huge opportunity with the younger generations and all the lasting impacts we can have through, through science. Fabulous. Words to live by, I'm sure. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you, Isan. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Thank you, Jad. I appreciate your time and your insights, and I will walk away a wiser woman having heard you. Thank you, Cara. Thank you all. Thank you, Cara. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, Cara, very much for the very professional moderation. I truly enjoyed listening to um, the experts sharing their perspectives on science. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for tuning in the launch of the State of Science, Science Index survey results. Before I proceed any further, I would like to thank our media partner, Forbes Middle East, for a great collaboration, and obviously for our speakers for sharing their personal insights on science. Never before, as it, as it was said, never before has science been so consistently on the minds of individuals worldwide. COVID-19 has uh, dominated much of the science, scientific and medical field, just as it has dominated news, reports, family chats, and online conversations. Discussions centered around its cause, diagnostic, treatments, and solutions, as well as its health, economic, social, and political implications. The global pandemic has put science and research into the spotlight, rarely has the impact it has on our everyday lives been so tangible to so many people. Individuals worldwide relied on health experts to understand what was truly going on. Scientific experts have become national spokesperson, provided explanations around the virus itself, offered advice on how to protect oneself from the virus, and rolled out vaccines to contain it. 
How has the public's opinion about science and scientists changed? Has the spike in science's match image come with greater public skepticism or support? As the role of science in our lives become increasingly relevant, our relationship with science catapulted into a positive territory not seen since 3M started tracking the state of science index full year, uh, four years ago. I hope you found this session beneficial and insightful on the state of science in the UAE. Leaving you with one final thought, echoing Mike Roman, our chairman of the board and chief executive officer for 3M. Science is becoming more of a uniting factor as the world, as the world moves towards a common mission to build a safer, greater, stronger, and more equitable future. Looking forward to connecting with you all next year to share with you an updated perception on science in 2022. Thank you again, and please do keep staying safe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laszlo. Thanks a lot for the closing remarks, and thank you, speakers, for the amazing insights into how science is transforming our daily life. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, without a doubt, has, I believe, underscored the pressing need to prioritize science, technology, and innovation in terms of policy making, resource allocation, and international cooperation. But I believe governments also need to make sure that the development benefits of SDI translate directly into the daily lives of people all over the world. We need to first understand how science has created a better world, improving healthcare and a more sustainable environment. COVID-19 has given us a unique opportunity to put science in the spotlight and make this a teachable moment to understand that science doesn't stand alone. It is connected to the well-being of communities, to employment, to transportation, to health, to economic well-being, to the safety and security of countries and the food that we consume every day. I would like to thank all of our speakers for joining us today and for sharing their thoughts on the topic. I would also like to thank 3M for launching the State of Science Index to this platform and giving us a more enhanced perspective on science and impacts in the region. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for this session. Uh, we look forward to hosting you in the future for our other sessions again. Thanks a lot. Thank you.